Hey folks, this is Riker with my review of Diablo 4 after having had review access for a few days. That on top of the beta experience, on top of the experience playing at Blizzard HQ, the end game build. Now, normally I don't make review videos, I make overview videos where I talk about a game, talk about its systems, I don't necessarily review and evaluate the merit of the game itself. But basically my entire channel has been an overview of Diablo 4, so the purpose of this video will be to help you decide whether you should buy Diablo 4 or not. Now, a little about me so that you understand the perspective that I'm coming from, since you should always consider a reviewer's perspective whenever possible uh, to understand their biases, their preferences. Reviews should ultimately seek to be unbiased, but people can't help but have preferences. So I've been a Diablo fan since I was about 12 years old. A lot of my high school days were spent on bail runs in D2. D3 was one of my most anticipated games of all time, and I have thousands of hours in Diablo 3 and Diablo 2. I was working as a video game journalist when Diablo 3 released, and I think I gave it an 85 out of 100. There was a lot of good, but it wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Torchlight 2, another ARPG, released a couple months later, and I'm pretty sure I gave that one a 95 out of 100. Now, I believe that the expansion Reaper of Souls greatly improved Diablo 3, and today I believe Diablo 3 is a very fun game with some significant flaws that prevent me from enjoying it as much as I could. I don't like the design of the Paragon system, I don't think the base itemization is particularly interesting, and years of power creep have made progression way too fast and drop rates are out of control. Now after having played a bunch of different ARPGs over the past decade, I believe what Diablo 3 does better than any other ARPG is the feel of combat. But I believe other ARPGs have more interesting itemization and character progression systems. So that's me and my preferences. So let's talk about Diablo 4, the game that is supposed to be a return to glory for Diablo. Many Diablo fans rejected Diablo 3. D3 was absolutely a huge commercial success. One of the best selling games of all time made a ton of money, but in some ways it was a giant failure because it made Diablo lose its status as uncontested king of the ARPG genre, and it led to the rise of competitors that kept closer to the Diablo 2 formula. Now, 11 years after the launch of Diablo 3, we have Diablo 4, whose whole motto is Return to Darkness, which is also symbolic in intending to be a return to the roots of Diablo, whereas Diablo 3 sort of strayed from that. But in addition to honoring the past, Diablo 4 is also taking a huge step in a different direction by having an open shared world, similar to an MMORPG, just without a massive amount of players, but you can walk from one end of the world to the other and you'll run into other players along the way. You'll see them in town, you'll join up with them against world bosses and random events. You exist in this persistent world. It's not just, I create a game, I'm in this instance, I leave, I create a new one, and it refreshes. Now, over the years of open development that the devs have shared with us, a development process more open than I think we've ever seen anywhere at Blizzard, it's clear that the devs are trying to recapture some of the elements of Diablo 2 and even Diablo 1 that were lost with Diablo 3. Did they succeed in doing so? Did they manage to bring the best of all Diablo games together into some uber Diablo game? Or did they make some ungodly Frankenstein abomination? Well, let's evaluate. Now to start, I'll say that this review won't cover the story. During my limited time with the game, I focused on gameplay and I skipped through all the story cutscenes and dialogue, but I will stream my full story playthrough because I very much care about story. Don't think that I don't. And I'll likely make a separate story review video. Also, story spoilers are under embargo, so we're not even supposed to be talking about that yet. What I will say, though, is that Diablo is a universe that is rich in lore. I mean, <laughs> I got a 17-part lore series about the Diablo lore, so... Uh, one thing about Diablo 4 is that it does a great job of building upon and expanding that lore in meaningful ways. Through revisiting and further fleshing out important characters, to giving us the opportunity to visit and experience places we've only heard about or read about before. But let's dive into the meat, the gameplay. Now, I said Diablo 3 has, in my opinion, the best in class ARPG combat. Diablo 4 basically takes Diablo 3's combat and improves upon it by adding a more tactical element to combat. We have the same fluidity of gameplay. Combat feels good and satisfying. And with some classes and builds, I'd go so far as to say it feels amazing. 
But additionally, now we also have an evade button, and enemies are designed in a way that encourages you to prioritize targets on the battlefield, move around a lot, not just stay stationary and hit it with my stick. There's more complex enemy mechanics to react to, and the game gives you tools to react to them, to dodge them. I'll note that I played on PC with a mouse and keyboard. I've heard good things about controller support, but I have no first-hand experience there. But uh, anecdotally, one staunch mouse and keyboard member of the dev team tried playing with a controller and hasn't looked back. So, combat feels great, but, well, maybe it's a but, the pace of combat is slower than other ARPGs. This is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your preferences. More tactical combat needs to have a slower pace. If what you are looking for is a mindless hack and slash where you just hold down a button and screens of monsters explode, this is not the game for you. At least not yet, who knows in a year or two what the pace of the game will be. One thing I will mention as a con for the gameplay is I found myself opening my map a lot while traveling in the overworld. So basically, I walk a bit, or I'm on my horse a bit, then open map, close map, move more, open, look at map, move more, and just repeat, repeat, and it's just this constant interruption of my game flow to open up the map. Now, I know there's been a big push from old school ARPG fans for an overlay map in Diablo 4. This is basically a map that overlays on top of your gameplay, so you're looking at a map and the gameplay at the same time. That would solve this, but Diablo 3 didn't have an overlay map, and I don't remember this being an issue in Diablo 3. Yes, I would have to open up the map, but not nearly as often. So I'm wondering, is this a factor of the minimap in Diablo 4 being smaller, thus revealing less than in Diablo 3? Or could it be that the cameras may be more zoomed in, so we can't see ahead of us as far? I don't know what it is exactly, but I definitely would appreciate having to open my map less often. Now on the topic of class balance and how every class feels to play. D4 launches with five classes, Barbarian, Rogue, Druid, Sorcerer, and Necromancer. More classes are expected to come, but not anytime soon. I generally prefer playing highly mobile ranged classes, and at low level, the Rogue remains my favorite class to play. It just feels so good, so fun. During the open beta, Barbarian and Druid were my least favorite classes. They didn't feel as fun to play, partially based on them feeling weaker, but also just struggling with mobility issues and sometimes resource generation issues. So what I can say is the balance pass that was made since open beta has improved things quite a bit. I tried all five classes in review, at least at low level, and class balance for early play felt a lot better. Necromancers are no longer overpowered, but they're also not garbage. Sorcerers are no longer overpowered and still very strong. Barbarians felt a lot better, Druid is still my least favorite early game class. It just, it feels weaker unless you're running a pet build. Pets are super strong, but everything else just feels quite weak. That said, Druid becomes very strong at high level. As for high level and game balance, look, it's gonna be a process as the community discovers the most broken builds. By season one, which is expected to be mid to late July, I'm expecting a balance patch that's going to put things in a, in a much better state. Not to say that they're in a bad state now, but evaluating the balance right now, I mean, again, it, it's going to change very quickly. This is going to be an evolving game with an evolving meta. But the early game is typically something that's not touched post-launch. And the early game experience right now is how new players will experience the game. This is going to be their first impression. And the balance there has gotten good but it could have been a bit better. Every class can definitely beat the campaign though. They can get through the content. That's not an issue at all. Now, the five classes they decided to launch with offer a good variety of play styles and flavor. And even within a class, you can feel like you can explore different class fantasies. You can be a fire sorcerer, a cold sorcerer. You can be a trap laying rogue or a sneaky backstabbing rogue. You can be a werewolf druid or a stormcaster druid. Between skill trees, paragon, gear, there's a lot of room for theory crafting and creating a variety of different builds. Now, every game will have meta builds, but it feels like we'll be able to see greater diversity of builds and greater diversity within a given build than we currently see in Diablo 3. And respect cost is not prohibitive, so you're not forced to roll up a new character to change your build. 
At low level, you can change your build very easily. And at high level, the cost just basically dissuades you from constantly changing build. I'll have a full video giving an overview of the different classes going out tomorrow. Stay tuned for that. Now, with regards to game difficulty, I'll say that Diablo 4 is not an easy game. You start off with normal and veteran difficulty modes, and you unlock two additional difficulty tiers by completing specific challenging dungeons. The game isn't super difficult, it's not a Dark Souls here, but it's more challenging than Diablo 3. ARPG veterans will have no problem conquering Diablo 4, but newcomers to the genre or more casual players, they might find themselves hitting roadblocks along the way, they might need to level up, might need to gear up before progressing further, might need to look up build guides to see what are they doing wrong and how can they continue on. And to some degree they might also just need to get good, because sometimes there's going to be fights that brute forcing your way through, I mean I guess eventually you might be able to, but you're going to have to learn attack patterns, you're going to have to learn boss mechanics. And the way that Diablo 4 approaches extra difficulty is great. First off, bosses and enemies in general just have more mechanics than past Diablo games. You got to react to these mechanics, you got attack patterns to learn, and on higher difficulties, enemies don't just get more life and more damage, but they become smarter and more aggressive, which is a great way to dial up difficulty. It's more interesting. And you want to unlock those higher difficulties in order to gain access to better loot. But the game's gonna make you work for it. So speaking about the higher tiers, let's talk about some of the driving forces of an ARPG. Progression and loot. First, progression. The feeling of becoming more powerful, evolving your build, going from zero to hero. Diablo 4 has enemy scaling. While playing the campaign, some zones have a minimum level, but once you reach that level, the zones scale up with you. You'll never be a level 50 character stomping around in a level 5 zone. And since the world scales up in level along with you, this can hurt your sense of progression. If the pace at which you are increasing in power via getting the right loot and spending skill points the right way, if this is not keeping up with how fast you're leveling up, you will actually feel weaker as you go higher in level. And you can never return to a low level zone to feel like a tough guy stomping on weak monsters. Now, this was a trade-off made in the interest of having an open world in which all regions remain relevant in the endgame. If monsters don't scale up with you, then all low-level regions would be ignored at the endgame. And I do believe this trade-off was worth it, because it allows for so much more variety of content in the endgame. But I can't say that it doesn't hurt that feeling of progression. Also, gear visuals don't really significantly progress as you level up. Seeing the visual progression of gear as you play through an RPG, going from shoddy ragtag armor to increasingly elaborate and fancy armor to arguably over the top, as a lot of people might, you know, say, that helps capture that feeling of progression. And D4 doesn't really have that. Gear instead is based on the regions. There's five regions and each has its own distinct gear visual style, which is cool. And you can argue that legendaries and uniques look more awesome than regular items and early game you're not decked out on them and as you level up you're getting more and more of these cooler looking items but we don't have these tiers of visual progression like in Diablo 2 or Diablo 3 that again helps you feel that journey more. It's a minor thing but it does impact sense of progression. Another thing that impacts sense of progression is the fact that you unlock your main damage dealer by like level 5 and that's the power you'll likely keep using as your main damage dealer all the way to level 100. It does become stronger with a greater skill point investment and supporting gear, but here's a level 100 Barbarian and here's a level 5 Barbarian and they're both using Whirlwind as their main attack. The progression of skills in D4 is instead based around horizontal progression rather than vertical progression like in Diablo 2. In Diablo 2 you unlock more powerful skills that obsolete your earlier skills. This creates its own issues which led to the synergy system, which again is not perfect, and I'm not suggesting that the D2 way of vertical progression was a better system, but you do feel the difference when you go from a level 1 skill to a level 12 skill to a level 30 skill. It's, it feels like a significant upgrade, it feels more awesome. With Diablo Force horizontal progression, you are instead expanding your toolkit. As you level up, you add more utility skills, and eventually possibly an ultimate, you're becoming a more well-rounded character. And this approach actually solves a lot of the issues with vertical progression systems, but it just doesn't feel as satisfying like changing out your main attack. 
However, what Diablo 4 does deliver is multiple vectors of progression. As you go through the game, you are progressing along a skill tree. You are then progressing along a paragon board. You're progressing your renown. You're progressing your codex of power. You're progressing through different tiers of itemization. You're progressing your gear upgrades. It always feels like there's a number of ways you can be advancing your overall power, which is great for keeping a player engaged and chasing after goals. But there is something a bit lost in the feeling of progression, just the experience. If I had to pick having one in my game over the other. If I could only have one of the two, I'd definitely go with having multiple vectors of progression like D4 has. That's what keeps me playing, but that sense of progression adds that extra magical quality to the experience. All right, onto loot and itemization, arguably the most important part of an ARPG. At least for me, all other gameplay, everything else in an ARPG is just to serve the purpose of the slot machine of kill monster, get random reward with a chance of winning big. Diablo 4 has normal, magic, rare, legendary, and unique items. The loot hunt overall feels nice. It's exciting to get legendary and unique drops. Drop rates feel good. The game doesn't rain legendaries down upon you, so it remains exciting to get a legendary drop, but they're not so rare that you'd go multiple play sessions without finding one. As for the itemization, that is the items themselves, their properties, their affixes, what we see is something of a combination between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 with some unique twists based on Diablo 4's unique mechanics. d itemization takes the best part of Diablo 3's itemization, legendary aspects. These are properties that will modify the way a skill works to allow for build changing and build defining items. Just, it doesn't bring along the absurd damage multipliers. It does not, in my opinion, take enough of the best of Diablo 2's itemization, however. There's definitely a Diablo 2 influence, but I wish that influence were stronger than it is. For instance, item bases. In Diablo 4, there are inherent differences between weapon types. A sword has certain native properties that an axe does not. That's great. But I wish we also saw that with armor and other gear. There's just no distinction between light, medium, and heavy armor, for example. A helm is a helm is a helm. It doesn't matter whether it looks like a light crown or a full-on knight's helmet. It's just a piece of artwork, and a helm always has the same properties. The thing that Diablo 4 does very differently with its itemization comes in the form of situational damage multipliers. You have damage versus vulnerable enemies as an affix, damage versus distant enemies, damage versus healthy enemies, etc. I have a full video going through all these terms over here. Do check that out if you're planning to play the game. Now on one hand, this opens up many build opportunities to create item and skill combinations that specialize in damaging enemies in specific ways. On the other hand, in general, affixes on gear just aren't as interesting or exciting as some other ARPGs. Outside of a legendary power, which that's always cool and exciting, I rarely look at an item and think, oh wow, what a great affix. Affixes generally contribute very small damage increases, like 5% more damage to vulnerable. Cool, that's helpful, but it's not exciting. You don't feel a 5% damage bonus. It doesn't appreciably change your gameplay experience. You know you're getting stronger. You can do the math, you can accept the numerical increase, but because it's not perceptible, you're not feeling that increase, it's just not exciting. In Diablo 2 at low level, you have a sword that deals an average of 5 damage per hit. Then you find a magic sword with an affix, plus 5 fire damage. Wow, that's doubling your damage, that's amazing. That is exciting and it's a very appreciable increase. Diablo 4's itemization and damage scaling system is basically designed that, as I understand it, if you don't keep those numbers low, then damage would scale out of control. So we can't just say as a simple fix, well, I'll increase that 5% to 50%, because then everything would spiral into trillions of damage. So again, it's a system that affords building characters via a variety of skill and item combinations that can benefit from and specialize towards different damage types and effects. You can have a vulnerable build, you can have an overpower build, you can have a fortify build. But the feeling of progression suffers in the meantime, and item affixes become generally less exciting. Basically, I feel like when it comes to progression in D4, with regards to skills and itemization and everything, the focus was on delivering a fantastic destination. A variety of final builds that allow for a multitude of playstyles and character customization. But the journey 
to that destination isn't as exciting as I would have hoped. All right, let's talk a moment about the forced multiplayer in D4. D4 has no offline mode and no ability to stop yourself from ever seeing another player. While playing through the campaign, you'll only run into people you invite into your party. But outside of that, you will see other players in town hubs, and you will run into them sometimes out in the open world. Dungeons remain private instances to you and your party, and world bosses will always see a group of players, around 12. Now, I'm someone who is very concerned about MMO elements making their way into Diablo 4. There's a lot that I dislike about having random people in my game. I don't mind it so much in town, it can hurt my immersion, but it's not the end of the world. But in the open world, I hate it when, in MMOs, players are competing over resources, waiting for monsters or bosses or quests to respawn because other players got there first. And the worst is when you see this lineup of people waiting. I can safely say that I have no problems with how Diablo 4 handles all this. On the occasion when I do run into a random person in the world, it's generally at a an event, random events can spawn, and their contribution is almost always welcome. The random world events are generally easier with help, and sometimes you get the pleasant surprise of joining an event in progress, or an event that's nearly complete, so you just show up and boom it ends and you get a nice reward chest. So running into other people outside of town has generally been a positive experience. The game has a trade system. You cannot trade legendary or unique items, but you can trade rare gear. I'm content with this. I do believe it is important to have a trade system. I think that's important for the health of a long-running online ARPG, but I don't want trade to be the most efficient way to gear up your character. Should there maybe be more things that you're allowed to trade in D4? Maybe there's room for adjustment here? It's hard to tell outside of experiencing that trade system in a living environment, but the core trade idea is solid. Some things can be traded, some things cannot be traded. Now, as for clans, the game has clans. It's about all we can say. It doesn't do much with them. Hopefully, clan features can be built up in the future. Maybe clan housing, where you can work towards unlocking cosmetics for your clan. Which, by the way, you can play solo, right? You can have a clan by yourself for solo players. But just imagine you have this house and you can mount trophies and whatever. That's just one example of a clan feature. Okay, let's hit upon all the other classic game review stuff now. Graphics and art direction. They nailed this. For those who didn't like the cartoony feel of D3, this is a firm return to grim and gritty. The game looks great. It's not going for 100% realism, but it's looking more like a realistic painting, which lends it a certain subtle style. The dark fantasy pervades every environment, every character, animations, environments, characters, monsters, everything looks great. Nothing stands out as subpar. Actually, you know what? <laughs> there are some icons, like the Necromancer Book of the Dead icons, that do stand out as not being up to the same quality standard as the rest of the UI. It almost looks like a placeholder asset, but everything in-game is great, and with the ability to customize the visuals of our character more than ever, we really get to appreciate the jump in graphics quality from D3 to D4. Environments are gorgeous, transitions between environments are seamless. The game even includes a vista mechanic where in specific designated regions you can make the camera angle come down to character level and kind of look forward over the shoulder onto the environment and that's always a visual treat. Dynamic lighting further enhances the mood. I remember this one particular instance of this lantern shaking in the wind and the way the light and the shadows of the lantern are cast on the environment. It reminded me so much of that that cinematic from Diablo 2 of the Wanderer emerging from that inn. Then sound design is similarly great. There's so much voice acting, which brings the world to life. Diablo 4 feels more alive than any other Diablo game, thanks in part to all the NPCs we get to meet and interact with. Probably more NPCs than all past Diablo games combined. All the sounds feel grounded within the world and even the game mechanic sounds, like drops, manage to effectively signal without sounding out of place. And every region has its own iconic music. Skosglen feels so... Viking. The Fractured Peaks has its mournful violin strings. Hawazar has this... Duduk, I think it's called? It's a horn instrument that is instantly recognizable. Then Kejistan has that sitar that gives that instant Arabian feeling. And the voice acting is fantastic with standout performances from Lorath and Lilith and 
the pale man who freed Lilith. I don't remember if his name is public yet. From a technical standpoint, Diablo 4 runs great. No crashes, good frame rates, no bugs, all very polished. Again, I played on PC for what it's worth. Okay, now let's talk about replayability and content. I think it's going to take the average player about 20 hours to play through the main campaign. Longer if you do all the side content along the way, and there's a ton of side content. From side quests to dungeons to, again, random world events. And because of how the campaign is designed, and because of the world scaling, you can play through the game in a non-linear fashion. You're not forced to play through the different regions of the world in a specific order. And this greatly enhances replay value. On subsequent playthroughs, not only can you choose to play another of the five classes, but you can play through the quests in a different order and spend more or less time on the side content of different regions. Then you get the post-campaign content, the end-game content. Diablo 4 is launching with more content in it than Diablo 3 has today. It's launching with more content than any ARPG has ever full launched with. Yes, other ARPGs today do have more content in them today after years of getting more and more content over time, but Diablo 4's base launch content will also continue to get expanded upon every three months, with the first season already again stated to come by late July at the latest. So outside of that main campaign, you got open PvP zones, you got randomized world bounty quests, you got over 120 dungeons, open world events, a few world bosses, hell tide events, which are temporary hell invasions, in a random part of the world, all while progressing through three key difficulty levels and defeating super dungeons to unlock those higher difficulties. There's enough variety of things to do to keep the average player busy for a while. I have a full video going over the endgame offerings right here. And then, on top of that, every new season should bring in some form of new content to add further replayability to the experience. So what we have is a solid foundation upon which content can continue to be built. There's potential for long-term engagement here. All right, now let's talk about value. For a base price of $70, you're getting a campaign that can take you 20 hours to go through, longer if you really explore all the side content. It's a full AAA narrative experience with cinematics, voice acting, cutscenes. Then there's the post-campaign content, and you can easily get a total of 80 hours of gameplay off of leveling one character. Multiply that by five different classes, and you got 400 hours of gameplay from just the base experience. Then factor in that the game will continue to get free seasonal updates every three months, and Diablo 4 can easily be a game that you can invest thousands of hours into over the course of years, assuming it remains fun for that long. All this for a base price of $70. Now, I don't know about you, but there are few forms of entertainment out there that deliver thousands of hours of entertainment for $70. ARPGs are generally very good value per dollar. Again, I got thousands of hours of fun off Diablo 2 and Diablo 3, and I'm expecting the same will apply to Diablo 4. Now, let's hypothesize that the first expansion releases in two years. You can easily have over 600 hours logged by then if you played 80 hours every season. So that's 600 hours of fun before you're expected to spend money on an expansion to keep playing the game with the latest updates. Now, of course, I haven't touched upon the Digital Deluxe or the Ultimate Edition or the in-game shop or the Battle Pass. In my review build, there was no in-game shop, no Battle Pass. But as far as we've been led to believe, all this stuff will be purely cosmetic. So you can choose to not buy any of it and not have your gameplay experience impacted. Whether it's good value per dollar is... It's pretty much up to you. I can't tell you how much you should value an imaginary pair of pants. Once we see prices though, we can compare them to what else is on the market. But again, we don't have that info yet. Similarly, the Battle Pass should also be entirely cosmetic. We do, however, know how much the Battle Pass will cost. It's $10 for the Basic Pass and $25 for the Accelerated Pass that lets you skip tiers. And that sounds about par for the course for the industry. As for the Digital Deluxe, you get four days early access to the game, plus some cosmetics, plus a Battle Pass. So $90, that's $20 more than the base game. And for everything that's included, that does seem like good value if you value those extra perks and cosmetics. The Ultimate Edition also gives you a special fancy emote, plus the Accelerated Battle Pass for $100. Again, this is good value because for only 10 more dollars, you're getting something that's worth 15 more dollars than the Digital Deluxe, plus an emote. However, again, this is if you value these things. If you plan to play the hell out of Season 1, then you don't really need the Accelerated Battle Pass, which in my opinion is 
more for people who believe they will not be able to put in the 80 hours required to complete a battle pass over the course of three months. So then, is the emote by itself worth an extra $10? For something that's not constantly visible on your character that you need to activate to show off for a couple of seconds? I'd say no, that's not worth $10. But, as a diehard Diablo fan, I'd spend that money anyway because I wouldn't forgive myself knowing that there's something in-game that other people got that I didn't. But if this were any other game, I wouldn't bother with any of that and just get the base $70 game. So, just a high-level summary of pros and cons here. Pros. Graphics, sound, and art direction are fantastic. Gameplay is smooth and fun. Game isn't mindlessly easy. Strong campaign experience. Huge amount of side content. Robust initial endgame offerings. Tons of replay value. Multiple play styles available for every class. Cons. Gameplay may be too slow for some modern ARPG fans. Itemization is not as interesting as some other ARPGs. Forced multiplayer is a turnoff for some people. Not all classes feel as good to play at low level. Sense of progression can be underwhelming. Alright, so, to wrap things up here, if Diablo 4 is your first Diablo game, and it sounds like the kind of game that interests you, then I think you'll enjoy Diablo 4 a lot. I expect tons of people to really enjoy Diablo 4. It may end up becoming the most popular Diablo game yet, and the most popular ARPG ever. If you are an ARPG fan who hates Diablo 3 to this day, then you may feel that Diablo 4 is too much like Diablo 3 for your liking. If you are a fan of the super fast pace of modern ARPGs, then you may find Diablo 4 is too slow for you. Diablo 3 opened up the ARPG genre to a more casual audience, and in doing so it lost depth of systems as a consequence. Diablo 4 is also opening up the ARPG genre to a wider audience, but this time not to a more casual audience, not by losing depth. It's opening up to the enormous audience of MMORPG players. Diablo 4's open world, its world bosses, its shared world experience, these are elements that will be very familiar to MMO players. Maybe they're even the reason that the MMO genre has always been so much bigger than the ARPG genre. But that said, the core gameplay of D4, the reward loop, the progression, the loot hunt, all of that remains fundamentally ARPG. And that's why, to me, no matter what MMO elements might be in D4, it is still an ARPG at its core. Diablo 4 has taken the Diablo franchise in a new direction. If all you want is more of the same, that's not what Diablo 4 is delivering. Diablo 4 is not an improved Diablo 2. It's not an improved Diablo 3. It does capture some of the best aspects of all Diablo games. It has Diablo 3's fantastic combat. It has a character progression system and skill point system more similar to Diablo 2. And it captures the gothic horror fantasy of Diablo 1. But on top of that, it's fundamentally changing the foundation upon which all of these systems exist by moving to this shared open world. And that can feel alien to an ARPG purist. This isn't a dumbing down of Diablo. It's also not an attempt to perfect the existing Diablo formula. It's a new adventure. And if you're a Diablo fan, you're either along for this ride, or you're not. But I can tell you that, for the greater gaming audience, it's going to be one hell of a road trip. But what are your thoughts on Diablo 4? Why are you or are you not planning to get it? Sound off in the comments. Because that's going to wrap up this video. But if you do plan to get Diablo 4, as a reminder, check out my guide going over all of the game terms that are important to know, and stay tuned for more guides. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider budging on YouTube or Patreon, and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.